Good morning once again. Turn with me to the Gospel of John, chapter 6. I don't know if I sound like a broken record, but it's been a real joy to um, look into the life of Christ. It almost feels like the chronicles of of Christ, if, if I could say that, and and to see what he um, directs us to, he moves us to the evangelist here, John, to direct our thinking and our hearts towards almost a, a concise way of his life and what it meant or what he meant for us to understand. The title of this sermon this morning is Enduring Food. Enduring Food, taken from the first parts of the discourse that Jesus begins to tell us about the bread of life. Let's read this passage, starting in verse 25. When they found him on the other side of the sea, they said to him, Rabbi, when did you get here? Jesus answered and said, Truly, truly, I say to you, you seek me, not because you saw signs, but because you ate of the loaves and were filled. Do not work for the food which perishes, but for the food which endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give to you. For on him the Father God has set his seal. Therefore they said to him, What shall we do so that we may work the works of God? Jesus answered and said to them, This is the work of God, that you believe in him who he has sent. So they said to him, What then do you do for a sign so that we may see and believe you? What work do you perform? Our fathers ate the manna in the wilderness, and as it, it is written, He gave them bread out of heaven to eat. Jesus then said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, it is not Moses who has given you the bread out of heaven, but it is my Father who gives you the true bread out of heaven. For the bread of God is that which comes down out of heaven and gives life to the world. Then they said to him, Lord, always give us this bread. Jesus answered them, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me will not hunger, and he who believes in me will never thirst. Pray with me. Father, this morning, our desire, our want, our heart's cry is to see your glory, to see the wonders of your Son, the only one that is worthy, the one that you have set your seal upon, the one that carries and holds our only hope. I pray now that you would help us to understand these things as your Holy Spirit teaches us, and that we will partake of this living bread and understand truly what it is to worship and adore you. We ask these things in Christ's name. Amen. These verses, starting in verse 26, are the majority of Jesus' words. If you have one of those Bibles, which I'm not really a big fan of, the Red Letter Bible, you might see that from verse 26 on to the end of the chapter, it's most literally Christ talking the whole time. So I want you to take notice because I think John the Evangelist, John the the author of this gospel, wants us to move quickly in a sense to Jesus' words. You you notice this. If you notice from verses 1 to 14, he narrates the account of the feeding of the 5,000. And when John narrates this this account of the feeding of the 5,000, which is more more than likely 25,000, including women and children, John attributes 26 words to Jesus. 
and less than that in the Greek. From verses 15 to 25, before we enter our passage, we get the account of Jesus walking on water. And John, the evangelist, again, only attributes seven words to Jesus. Just seven words in that account. But, listen, this is not to say that there's, I mean, you guys understand this, that I'm not saying there's less inspiration in the first 25 verses. No, it's not true because I've been preaching it as such. It's absolutely God's word. It's to point out one basic thing, and it's really just what John is doing. John has really moved us quickly, quickly into the words of Jesus. From the miracles, he moves quickly away from the miracles and right into what? The meat of Jesus' work, his preaching. John needs to give way to Jesus' words. This Jesus, the greatest preacher to have ever lived. The passage from verse 26 to the end of the chapter holds the most beloved, the most beloved doctrines in the church. It also holds the most controversial words of Jesus Christ. Still debated today. Words that people today would if, if you do not believe in Christ, if you are not regenerate, you would not accept what he's saying. Jesus even knew this. He says it in verse 61 in our chapter here. He says the, the disciples, even the disciples grumbled. And he said to them, does this cause you to stumble? Do these words that I'm saying cause you to stumble? Verse, the verses 26 to 40, he speaks to this general population, the general population of the people that had eaten the bread and, and the fish, right? The when he did the miracle, this is, these are the people he's talking to. And then he moves from verse 41 to 58. He begins to speak to the Jewish leadership there in Capernaum. So he addresses these people differently. And I want you to notice in the next few weeks, he addresses the people in a certain way in the passage that we're reading all the way, like I said, through verse 40 and then verse 41 to 58, he addresses the leadership and he's going to talk to them differently. We have much to learn about this interaction. One of the greatest things we need to understand is that Jesus will shatter the traditions of men. Their understanding of Messiah was wrong, just simply wrong. But he starts by correcting their view about miracles. Even the miracles he had just done, he just performed. The next few weeks, we carefully consider, I want you to carefully consider the words of Jesus. And what do they mean? What do they mean now? What did they mean in the first century? What do they mean when they came out of his mouth? And then what do they mean to you now? What weight do they carry in your life today? So it's very simply, I have three points. It's true food verses 26 and 27, true work, verses 28 to 30, and true life, verses 31 to 35. To give context and geography, verse 59 tells us that Jesus and his disciples are now in Capernaum. You remember the, the walking on water? And we, when they see him, and then he performs many miracles. And one of the greatest miracles, apart from him walking on water, was that he literally 
transported their ship right to the, the docks at Capernaum. So then now in Capernaum, and Jesus is, like it says here, he's preaching in the synagogue in Capernaum. Again, Jesus begins to, to preach. Much of what he's doing is calling these people to genuine belief, to a saving faith. It's not there. How many people are following him still? I don't, I don't know. Is it 5,000? Is it, is it this huge crowd? It is, is it, has it grown? Jesus is not impressed by the crowd. Listen, he, he doesn't, he's not interested in the crowd. He's really basically always just interested in one thing, to draw out genuine faith. So they say to him, after they've been looking for him, verse, remember verse 22 to 25, he's, they're doing this, where did he go? The only boat that was at Capernaum, that only could, the only one that could arrive because of Christ is that boat. So they finally find him. And they respond to him in verse 25, or they ask him, Rabbi, when did you get here? Jesus has, this is interesting, Jesus has no time for small talk. Verse 26, Jesus answered them. Well, first, do you think he answered the question? No, he's not interested in that. Truly, truly, I say to you, you seek me, not because you saw signs, but because you ate of the loaves and were filled. Truly, truly, or amen, amen, in the Greek, he's saying, listen up, I'm about to tell you something of vital importance. And he, he does that immediately with a really, a, a, a really sharp rebuke. You don't follow me. Not because you saw signs, not because you saw a miracle, but because you ate, because you were filled with bread and fish. The introduction to this conversation, it's important because, like I said, he's going to give truth or truths that are foundational. Jesus exposes their hearts because they were only thinking about the material side of things. Thinking about physical food and physical fish of this miracle but it was enormously short-sighted. Or better yet, these people were completely blind by superficial, materialistic desires for food alone. They had full bellies but empty hearts. Remember that the, the reaction that they had they wanted to make him king in verse 15. Remember that? We'll read it. So Jesus is perceiving that they were intending to come and take him by force by making him king. He withdrew again to the mountain by, by himself alone. He had no desire to, to, to become something that the people wanted him to be. And in a really simple understanding, they had to conform to what who he actually is, not for what they wanted him to be. For what they wanted him to be was worthless at the time. Jesus is king already, is he not? Does he not sit on the throne as we speak right now? The creator of all things. They had a short-sighted view or a short-term view of Messiah. So Jesus calls out their selfish bluff and their foe-seeking. 
The miracles of Jesus pointed beyond themselves. Listen, they pointed beyond themselves, like the actual, the actual miracle. Past the loaves that, that perish, he calls it. I mean, he says it in verse 27, do not work for the food that perishes. It's all temporal, right? Look past this, he says. Look to the eternal. Look, look to the heavenly. The signs challenged everyone that saw them. And really what it did is it beckoned them to see past them and to see the true person and purpose of Christ. His life, his death, his resurrection. To live for today, to live for the eating of the loaves and, and the fish means nothing. What does it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his soul? What does it profit if you eat the loaves and the fish? What does it profit if you live this life for all that you want and then lose the greatest thing that, the God, that God has given you that is eternal, that it'll spend its time in eternity either in heaven or in hell. You see, properly perceived, the signs ought to deepen and undergird our faith in Christ. To see these signs correctly, they are a gift to us. Pointing us to this enduring food that he's telling us about. That, that produces eternal life, Christ says. Turn back to, to John 3. Beloved passage, John 3, look at verse 15. That's so that whoever believes will in him have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, there's that word again, but have eternal life. Do not work for the food that perishes. Chapter 4, look at verse 13. Jesus answered, said to her, Everyone who drinks of this water, making a contrast, will thirst again. But whoever drinks of the water that I will give him shall never thirst. But the water that I will give him will become in him a well of water springing up to eternal life. Chapter 6, verse 35. Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. I am the bread of life. The one who comes to me will not hunger. Again, if, if they're thinking about it wrong, they would say, of course, like, I don't want to hunger anymore. You know, it's a little bit difficult for us being modern people, say, quote-unquote, modern people. We don't work for, we don't toil the land and to, to make food for ourselves, in a sense, to, to grow food for ourselves. In that time, in the first century, it was, it was hard work. You didn't just go to Vons or Ralph's and pick up your food, you know? So these people were just really interested in like, well, he did this. He just gave us dinner last night. Maybe he'll give us breakfast this morning. And he's saying, has literally almost nothing to do with that. The miracle had nothing to do with that. It had everything to do with, number one, Christ is divine. Christ is God. And then he tells you, I'm more than willing to give you eternal life if you will look past the material. Look away from your current physical need so that your life is, you see your life as more than food and clothes. 
Luke 12, 23, doesn't that say that for your, is your life more than food and your body more than clothing? Look to the one that desires and has been given authority. He says it. He says, for the father, for him, the father has set his seal. To what? To dispense an enduring food to eternal life. Look at Romans chapter 16. Just to undergird, undergird this idea, in Romans 16, look at verse 17. Now I urge you, brethren, keep your eye on those who cause dissensions and hindrances contrary to the teaching which you learned, and turn away from them. So what is this? What are these people? What is the heart of these people that, that don't want to... A lot like the... These people that are following him now and and in doing this interrogation of Christ and, and telling him, what's the heart of these people? He tells you in verse 17, this here we go, this is explained to you. This is for such men are slaves, not of our Lord Jesus Christ, but their own appetites. They only have an idea of what should life be about. And it's about just stuff and my own desires and my own wants. These people says they caused dissension and hindrances contrary to the teachings you've learned. It says, not of the Lord Jesus Christ, but their own appetites, and by their smooth and flattering speech, they deceive the hearts of the unsuspecting. Peter calls them. Cause the, the, the appetite the, in their belly, it, they're driven by this. They're just driven by want. And Jesus is telling you, don't look at what you think you need. Look at what you actually need. It's, you know it's difficult, it is. For believers, we understand this. This is the desire of Christ is that you would see your need for eternal things. The true work. Look at verse 28. Back in John 6, it says, Therefore he said to him, Am I in the right place here? Yes. Therefore he said to him, What shall we do so that we may work the works of God? Do, do you notice the wording here? This is this is still them trying to like you're blind and you're trying to grasp for, for something. You you can't grab it. You 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 think that you understand what Christ is saying, but you again you're so blinded by your own wants that you you're grasping for things. You're you reach and you can't you can't grab it. Because this is look at the wording that says, You shall what shall we do? What shall we do? Isn't this pointing again? It's me. It is the rabbinic view, it's the Jewish view of like, how do I do something that's going to make me right with God? It says, what shall we do? But that's not what he said. Look at verse 27, the second part says, the Son of Man, look at what it says, will give to you. What is, what is the natural response? If, if Christ were here before you, he says, I am willing to give this to you. Do you respond back? Well, what do I need to do to get it? 
Do, do you see the short-sighted view? Do you see that that man is always, always deep down in the heart, so wretched and blind that he desires to justify himself, desires to do something for which he cannot do. Turn back to John 4. Remember that Jesus is having this conversation with the woman at the well. <laughs> Although she struggled with the same things that this, these people are struggling with. The conversation back and forth sounds almost alike. But she responds differently. She responds almost as if she's almost there. She could almost see it. The scales are falling and she could see it. And she says to him in verse 15, the woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so that I will not be thirsty nor come all the way here to draw from that well. I will give to you. And she says, I want to grab it. She's still thinking water. I, I understand that. But at least she's thinking past some sort of frivolous idea in her head of what God or what Christ, the God man, is standing before her and is offering to her. She still had, an, I guess, a naturalistic response, but it was better than, than, than any kind of other ridiculous response. She says, will you give this to me? Will you give me this water? You, you know what? We know the rest of the story. Did, did Jesus give her that water? Yes, he did. As a matter of fact, her and her whole town, the majority of the town came to know Christ. First through her testimony and then through Christ. She received that water. Listen to what Jesus had revealed to this point. Turn back to John 6. Listen to what Jesus had already revealed to these people. Believe verse 27. Do not work for the food that perishes, but for the food which endures to eternal life, for which the Son of Man will give to you. For on him the Father God has set his seal. What did, what did they, he had just revealed? Literally, the thing that he just said before, he revealed a few things. He said, one, he's the Son of Man. A title of Messiah, a Messianic title from the Old Testament. Again, then he says he, that for the Father has set his seal on him. He's saying that the Father has given him authority. And thirdly, that he provides, that Jesus Christ provides eternal life. Do you see why it's, it's odd to respond in the way they do? Because he said these things. This is what he's saying. And then they respond, what shall we do so that we may work the works of God? Isn't even that kind of an odd statement to say? That we may work the works of God. Who do these works belong to? It's in the sentence. What they land on is works. Our default setting from birth. They misunderstood. By default went back to the workspace salvation that they embrace. Jesus is not, listen, Jesus is not inventing a new system or structure or redemption. But he's really, what he's doing is bringing clarity to true salvation. In one verse, Jesus gives the gospel in its simplest form. In his response, verse 29, Jesus answered and said to them, This is the work of God. 
that you believe in him who sent, who he has sent. This is the work of God. So he went from the way they responded. It says, how do we work the works of God from, from plural? Jesus takes it to singular. This is the work of God. Period. Done. Turn to Ephesians chapter 1. Because if we understand something that, well, we must understand that this work of salvation is primarily a work of the Father. The Father sent the Son. The Son accomplished the redemption. The Holy Spirit sets his seal on those who believe. But the Father, the Father has put this into motion. In eternity past. And he says this in Ephesians 1, starting in verse 2. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with eternal spirit, spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. Just as he, that's the Father, chose us in him, that's the Father again, that he would be holy and blameless before him, that's the Father again. Verse 5, he predestined us, that's the Father. This is the Son through Jesus Christ to himself, verse 5, that's still the Father. According to the kind intention of his will, that's the Father's will. To the praise and the glory of his grace, that's the Father's grace, which he freely bestowed on us and the beloved, that's he, the Father, freely bestowed. Verse 7, in him, that's the Father, we have redemption through his blood. That is a paradox. The God that has blood. But it's this father's doing. According to his riches of his, his grace, verse 7. Verse 8, which he, the father, lavished on us. Verse 9, he made known to us the mystery of his will, according to his kind intention, which he purposed in him. The father, the father, the father. It's not a new plan. He brought it about. Turn to Psalm 19. Psalm 19, verse 14, let the words of my mouth and meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. God is a savior. Psalm 34, Psalm 34, verse 22, it says, the Lord redeems the souls of his servants. And none of those who take refuge in him will be condemned. That's the heart of the Father. That's the heart of Christ. He says that he came to us to what? To reveal the Father. Go to Isaiah 43. This is the first part of the verse in verse 14, Isaiah 43, verse 14. Thus says the Lord, your Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel. Chapter 44, verse 6. 
Thus says the Lord, the King of Israel, and his Redeemer, the Lord of hosts. Verse 24, same chapter. It says, Thus says the Lord, your Redeemer, the one who formed you from the womb. This is, this is the character of God, that he's, he's a God that takes glory and, and majesty and, and saving and redeeming. And this, this Trinitarian work of, of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. But G- Jesus is li- most literally, Colossians 1, he showed us the Father. In every form of his attributes. Lamentations 3.58 says this. O Lord, you have pleaded pleaded my soul's cause. You have redeemed my life. The Lord is a redeemer by nature. And Jesus provides the definitive answer to that redemption. Belief in him. The work of God has been done. That's what he's saying. How can we do the works of God? You can't do the works of God. Because the works of God are already done. You can't add and you can't take away from it. Your option is to yield to it. Turn back to the Gospel of John. You're called to faith, to trust in that work. You don't have to turn there, but in Romans 3.28, it says that for we maintain that a man is justified by faith apart from the works of the law. And this, is a, this will give us context because what will these people invoke later on? Will it not invoke Moses? Moses, the, the, the type of law, the type of the law? In Romans it says, no, that you are not. A man is justified by faith apart from the works of the law. Galatians 2.16 says the same thing. It's really just an acknowledgement of your dependence upon God alone. So we get one of the five solas, right? By faith alone. In Christ alone. Verse 30. So they said to him, what then do you do for a sign so that we may see and believe you? What work, here we go again, do you perform? Work. Work, work. The people change the direction in a sense. Or, or bring their focus back to the, the signs, back to the miracles all over again. It, it's almost like they're saying, okay, yeah, we hear you, Jesus. Yeah, 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 okay. We hear you. But what about the miracles? Let's go back to this, the substance again. They go from what do we do to do the works of God, and now they say, what do you do? What work do you do? Do do you hear the arrogance in that? He just told you. Jesus just gave you the answer. This is the work of God that you believe in him who sent him, who has sent him. And then arrogantly turn and say, well, what do you do? And I remember a conversation. There was a, a street preacher and preaching in some college and an open air preaching. And the girl goes, this girl that challenges him says, well, show me. Show me the medical evidence that Jesus rose from the dead. He's like, are you serious? We have 
accounts of Jesus' resurrection, but you want a, a, an uninvented form of some sort of medical documents that will prove it to you. It's literally, it's just the same thing. I don't want to believe, so just jump through this hurdle for me. And Jesus is like, no, no. Your entrance into eternal life is belief. It's for you to trust in Christ. And he even tells them to trust in Christ is, is the same as a synonym to trusting God himself, the one who sent him. This is a form of grumbling that they're doing. What do you do? Look at what he said already. Verse 27, do not work, it says. Do you see the beginning of the verse? Verse 28, what shall we do is their response. He says, do not work. And then their response is, what do we do? And then verse 29, the work of God is already done. It's done. What's the response? Okay, verse 30, what do you do then? Man, it's a miracle that Jesus had this most patience with them, right? No heart change, no true listening. But I ask you, do you have ears to hear? Do you hear what he's saying? And we come to true life. My last point here in verse 31. Our fathers ate the manna in the wilderness. As it is written, he gave them bread out of heaven to eat. What are these people saying? They just asked him to perform a miracle again. They says, well, you know, do something. Come on, magician. Pull a rabbit out the hat. And then they tell him, well, let's, let's juxtapose you to Moses. And let's do this. Let's, he says, well, okay, you did. They, I wouldn't say that they denied that Jesus did a miracle in the loaves and the fish. But could it be that they're, they're diminishing it? Because the bread that came down, the manna that came down in Deuteronomy 8 from heaven was directly from heaven. It was directly from God. So were they saying, well, Moses did this, which is almost like saying what he did was greater than what you did. This is a lie. Because God is not opposed to himself, is he? Jesus turns their thoughts. Listen, as they turn their thoughts to something that's familiar, he will flip the script on them when they're trying to posture up Moses against Jesus himself. They quote, or they quote the big idea, these people, from Psalm 78 and Exodus 16. But he will first correct them. Look what he says. Verse 32. Here goes another amen, amen moment. Truly, truly, I say to you, it is not Moses who has given you the bread out of heaven. It was not Moses. You have trusted Moses. You have trusted his law and his law keeping. You think to yourself, that's how you'll be saved. Moses cannot save anyone. He says, Moses did not give you this bread, but it is my father who gives you the bread, the true bread, out of heaven. You have trusted this temporal bread. Later on, he says, they ate of the bread, and guess what happened? They died. They ate it, and they still died because it was temporal. Jesus tells them, my father provided that manna. 
in the same way that I provided the loaves and fish. He makes it emphatically clear. Not Moses, me. Not Moses, the father. Jesus had already given them this understanding. They've been having these same conversations already. Turn to chapter 1 to see that Jesus has been talking about this as they've been trying to put him against Moses constantly. Look at chapter 1, verse 17. For the law was given through Moses. Here we go. Grace and truth. That is, that's the dividing line right there. Grace and truth were realized through Jesus Christ. Yeah, you have the law. But we have a grace and a mercy found in Jesus Christ alone. He says it again. Look at chapter 3. Verse 14. He says, okay, you have this trust in Moses. He goes, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, a foreshadowing of Christ. He says, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up on a cross. Chapter 5. Look at verse 45. Do not think that I have accused, I will accuse you before the Father. No, he's not going to do that. He says, I'm going to play your little game as he's talking to them. Because if you believe in Moses, guess what? He says, the one who accuses you is Moses. In him, in whom you have set your hope in. For if you believe, if you believed Moses, if you truly believed Moses and his work, says you would believe me. For what? For he wrote about me. They had put their trust in Moses. A huge miscalculation. We do the same today, guys. I'm not even trying to make it as though, well, we don't do this. No, we do this a lot. Our heart is deceitful and wicked, and it, it desires to justify itself by law-keeping. Even those that are redeemed do it, sadly. They think that from doing things, doing their even Christian rituals, which you should not be doing. Christian rituals are saying, well, if I get up in the morning early enough and read my Bible and, and pray enough and read enough, and go to church enough, and serve enough, 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 enough. Literally, you're saying that God would not be happy with you. I'm going to tell you right now, you are no more and no less justified in Christ than the day that you believed. Those things are well and great and beneficial, but the motive is not that you are doing it to be saved or that God would be satisfied with you. You can't do that. Only Christ could do that. Don't fall into this this Moses kind of mentality, this type of justification. If you sit here and you have not given your life to Christ, you are under that law. The law of Moses does condemn you. But there's grace found in Christ. Jesus is continually drawing their attention and our attention to spiritual realities. The same Lord that had had given the bread and the manna from heaven, that that in, in the Old Testament, that being a type or a foreshadowing of this true bread. Jesus has, or Jesus was doing the same in the feeding of the 5,000. That they would look past that. The man of the bread, the 5,000, only were a, a, a physical type of life. 
But the bread, the spiritual bread, is far, infinitely more superior than Moses' manna. He offers life eternal. Not a temporal life, but a life that proceeds from God. These, these people almost, when we get to this verse 34, they, they, they like the Samaritan woman, they, they begin to almost like respond in a better fashion. It's not, it's not perfect. It's still short-sighted, but they say this. It says, they said to him, Lord, always give us this bread. Always give us this bread. Still blind, but are near to a clearer understanding. It says, though Jesus is speaking another language that they don't understand, and it's, it's this holy, transcendent, Jesus, he's, he's wholly other and different than us. And then when he speaks, because I'll tell you this, if you heard this in person from Christ himself, you think, what is he saying? But I must believe it. Because he's no mere man. The light that has come down from heaven. The one that has descended, John 3, descended, right? Condescended, humiliated himself to become man. For the sake of what? To save sinners that the Father may be glorified. He responds to them this way in closing in verse 35. He says this, for the bread of the bread of God is that which comes down out of heaven and gives life to the world. Verse 35, it says, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me will not, will not hunger. And he who believes in me will never, never thirst again. This bread from God that gives eternal life. Next week, we'll go on to this passage of the bread of life, because I don't want to get into that verse itself. There's a lot of implications in verse 35. But you see that they're still asking for this, these physical needs. And Christ will remove all doubt, any shadow of thinking, But, you know, today in churches, this is, this is how much many churches operate. The, the, the characteristics of the modern church, they, they focus on felt needs, right? What well, felt need is here. Let's create a ministry for that. There's another felt need. Let's create another ministry for that. And, and they miss the, the broader scope of, of what's, the gospel should be doing inside the church. You know, there's many people that go to different churches for different reasons. They go to a church for one, let's say, if they have something for my kids. They have this program for my kids. And, and by saying that, it's almost like saying, well, I, I want the church to raise my kids. And I'll tell you why I say that after I'm done here, but. Or they say something like, well, I want to go somewhere where I can find a spouse. You know what that's saying? That you're not content in Christ. Or they have a program to fill my mind. I want deeper and higher theology and doctrine. And that's all great. What about filling the heart? What about that? Or I want more entertaining music. 
I want a full band and lights and all these things. And what are you saying? I want you to feel my emotions, but not my thoughts. Or the cult of personality. I'm going to go to that church because of this particular pastor. You missed the point because it's, I'm going to go to the church because of Christ. Let me tell you what the early church didn't have. They didn't have any of that. They didn't have a children's ministry. They weren't focused on going to a church to find a spouse. They weren't going to try to fill their heads with knowledge only. They weren't going to be entertained. And they weren't going for their cult of personality either. The early church, listen, had none of those. They, had, they did have pastors. And even Paul squashes that idea in 1 Corinthians 1 where he says, if you go to a church because of a particular person, pastor, cult of personality, you're tantamount to saying, I'm of Paul, I'm of Apollos. Their church had none of those things. You know what they did have? They had Christ. And everything that is done in the church is based in that. Yes, you have the theology classes based in Christ. You have children ministry based in Christ. You have nursery based in Christ. You have a young adults ministry based in Christ. Everything is based in the work of Christ. Listen, the church's foundation is Christ. 1 Corinthians 3.11 says that, For no man can lay a foundation that, that other than which it was already laid, which is Christ. And this, this church is still being built on the Lord. Adding these, First Peter says, these living stones. First Peter 2, 4 says, Coming to him, Christ, as the living stone, choice and precious. This building being built. Every ministry, gospel-centered. This building has its lifeblood in the bread of life with its entrance into eternal life via faith in Jesus alone. It's not about what we have or what we don't have. It's really that we, own, that we have Christ alone. And we have the gospel and we have redemption. And if you have Christ, you have everything, do you not? Verse 35, it says, and the bread of life, he who comes to me will not hunger, and he who believes in me will never thirst. So what are these things? Just to close it out, he tells them, one, he says, he who comes to me. This implies a forsaking of your own life. That when you come to Christ, you don't come to add Jesus to your life. You come in exchange for your life. He who comes to me, he says. And then he says, and the he who believes. That implies trusting in Christ by faith alone. And the result, what's the result? A promised eternal life. I love this because there's a quote by Spurgeon. It says, you and your sins must be separate or you and your God will never come together. You need the Lord Jesus today, and you need him tomorrow. And you need him right into eternity. I'm going to close it out before we come to the Lord's table with a quote, a longer quote by Charles Spurgeon. And it says this, he says, I quote, you hardly know on what ground the Bible is accepted as true. And hence, cunning infidels give you a good shaking when they get a hold of you on that point. But there is one thing on which you can never be shaken. 
You feel the gospel must be true because it just suits the needs of your heart. If any man should say to you when they are thirsty, water is not good, you would say, give me more of it. I have a thirst in it, and hear that it makes me desire it. By irresistible process, strongly, stronger than logic itself, you can prove to yourself that water is good because it quenches your thirst. Just so with bread. When you are hungry, if you come to the table and a philosopher says to you, you do not understand the ground on which bread nourishes the, the human form. You do not know anything about the process of digestion and the method of assumption and how the bones are nourished, are nourished by the phosphorus and the lime and by the silica containing the flour. He said, you don't know the science of all these things, what goes when the bread goes in. And you would say this, I don't know. And I don't care particularly to know. But one thing I do, I'm sure bread is good to eat if I am hungry and I will show you. Then you seize the loaf and begin to cut and eat. So it is, so it is with believing in the heart. The heart is hungry. Therefore, the heart feeds on Jesus. The heart is thirsty. Therefore, the heart drinks the living water. And so the heart believes unto righteousness. That's the heart of the one that believes. That is faith. That you would trust him in what he has already said to you. Look past the material and look to Christ. Let's pray. Father, Our hearts are full and our hearts are glad because your gospel is true. Lord, the work of your son is of infinite value. And this morning, I pray that you would help us, Lord, to take of, by faith, take that bread and eat. Assume it into our own being that we would become one with you. Lord, we thank you so much that we cannot work the works of God because you have already worked them for us. Lord, I pray now that you would strengthen your church. And for those that do not believe, I pray that you would bring them to true belief, to a saving faith that they would not trust in themselves that they would see that you as holy are one that calls the world to repentance, that they would turn from sin, and that they would see their need for the redemption that is found only in your Son. I pray now that you would grant that faith and repentance for those that do not know you. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.